shame was something that I didn't need in my life. Shame was between me and God. God's grace covers my shame. So God is only God that deals in shame. People deal in shame. He wants you to admit what you've done, take the guilt and be responsible, mm -hmm. but he doesn't deal in shame. Mm -hmm. People deal in shame so that they can control you and your emotions. You're listening to Dr. Spence, Women on Women Abuse and Shame. Let's go. Six years ago, my wife took nothing but an ideal and faith and turned it into a multi-million dollar business with multiple streams of income. As a woman possessed, she overcame all obstacles and created multiple streams of wealth that has impacted our family for generations to come. From mental health professional, to therapist, to author, to CEO, she is a constant reminder of the grace of God over her life. Get ready to listen to and take notes from Stanell, the money therapist, as she schools you on money, entrepreneurship, and life skills that was not taught. No more excuses. Wake up! Thank you for that introduction, husband. Welcome back to No More Excuses, Wake Up, where we talk about money, entrepreneurship, and life skills that was not taught. I am your host, Danelle Myers, also known as Danelle the Money Therapist, with guest Dr. Deborah Spence. Deborah is the CEO and owner of Need to Talk Counseling and Wellness Center. She and her team also offer services of marriage and relationships, child and adolescent, art therapy, women issues, family intervention, personality, men issues, depression and anxiety, pandemic fatigue, career counseling, adjustment disorders, and bariatric evaluations. I am happy to say Dr. Spence is a new neighbor of mine and friend in the state of Florida. Welcome to the show. How are you? Well, thank you for having me. I am fantastic. I am so happy to have you on the show because you and I were neighbors and yes. we actually <laughs> just met. Yes. And we have so much in common. Absolutely. We weren't strangers when we met. <laughs> I truly believe that because we have so much in common. One of the things we have in common, as I mentioned in the introduction, you have a bachelor's in science education. You hold four degrees. Let's make that clear. <laughs> yes. You also have your first master's is in speech and language pathology. Your That's second true. master's is in master's in mental health counseling. Your fourth degree is you have a doctorate in philosophy, and that is a concentration in psychology and leadership. That's correct. Wow. Sounds like a lot of time in books, huh? <laughs> Definitely a lot of times in books. You have an, a counseling agency that's called Need to Talk. Yes, it's called Need to Talk, LLC. And I like to think about it as a mental wellness agency focused on wellness. And it's in Southfield, Michigan. However, we will be expanding to the great state of Florida come this summer. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to that as well. So can you tell me a little bit about Need to Talk? Because you said that it's not a counseling agency. You look at it as a, a mental wellness. Yes. We call our clients clients. We don't call them patients. We focus on wellness. We have fun during therapy. We laugh a lot. And I think that if we said agency, it just kind of puts a negative spin on it. And the atmosphere mm -hmm. is just so uplifting. So we call it a wellness center because that's the focus. We all want to be well. That actually makes a lot of sense, especially coming from the mental health, because we both share that, that perspective. And back in the day, we used to call our clients consumers. Ah, mm -hmm. I like that. Now with me doing DDD, it went from participants to now individuals. So when you said that you call them clients, I think that sometimes we try to find words that is not offensive to the individuals 
or the clients that we actually serve. Yes, uh, I, I like it. I, I agree with that. I like the word clients because you can be an attorney and have a client. You can be, it could be a high business proposition and you would call them clients. Your life is important. It's probably it's the most important thing you have. So we call them clients. We take what we do very seriously. We love our clients because we love people. We love mm -hmm. each other. Out of respect to them, they're clients because everyone who comes and seeks counseling or someone to talk to isn't necessarily pathological. Mm -hmm. It isn't, you know, as in sometimes in the community, you think, oh, that person's crazy. Mm -hmm. If they talk to someone, no, they're not. That's I don't right. understand why you could be not crazy if you would talk to a bartender, but you'll be crazy if you talk to somebody who's trained. It doesn't make sense. It does not. But there's a stigma with that. And I think that's why people say, I don't want to talk to someone that is trained because they're going to try to tell me what to do. Or, you know, sometimes there's a stigma, especially when people don't, they don't, they don't know the first thing about counseling. And I can tell when someone calls and it's their first time. So I'm very careful with them. So I say to someone who doesn't know about counseling, because historically in the African-American community, you keep your business in the house. I would say, especially to a, a gentleman, I would say, hmm, got a nice car, huh? Yeah, have a nice car. Okay. So what if I said that you spend all this money for a car, but you would never take it in for oil change. You would never take it in to rotate your tires. You would never take it in for service at all. How does that sound? And they said, that's crazy. And I said, but then your brain and your head and your well-being is far more precious than a car, but yet you mm -hmm. never take it in for a checkup. I like that. I like that. That's, that's a great analogy. I like that. And then how do he respond? Like, oh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you just talk to people. Another reason to talk to people professionally is that you know, sometimes in families, we can say something about a spouse or someone, and then later on, we're all hugged up with them, but the family doesn't forgive. Can you, <laughs> you know? please expound on that a little bit, please? <laughs> that is so important because when we open up to someone and then we break up with them, the family already broke up with them, but now you're back mm -hmm. with them. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And also sometimes with that person that they were talking about, they will give their partner grace, but they don't give the family grace. Come on, come on. You know, come those on. mercies. And when you're married, you got to have mercies every day in order to stay married and be married successfully. Yes. But that doesn't necessarily extend to your family. So you know what? Your family's prejudiced. But go talk mm -hmm. to somebody who Wait a minute. doesn't have that. any skin in the game, who doesn't have a, a fight in the dog, a dog in the fight. Well, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you said your family's prejudice. Break that down. Absolutely. Well, your family knows you. They love you. They're just not objective. They may love your person. They may not have wanted you to marry the person or to be with the person. So your family has skin in the game and they have emotions and baggage in the game. Sometimes it's just best to talk to somebody who's skilled and who can see both sides of the fence or the mm -hmm. argument mm -hmm. and then use those skills to bring you to a win-win situation. When I'm counseling someone, uh, particularly a married couple, I want to see them have a win-win. And so you're honest. I like to say that I pour whiskey straight up and I warn them, I pour whiskey straight up. I tell you the truth. But as my clinical manager says, we'll put some honey on it. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, we're honest and, we, and, and our goal is to bring you together, not to break you up, mm -hmm. but to create a win-win. You know, I often say you, if you go over with Jack, you need to learn how to speak the language of Jack because he lives in that land. And if you go over with Jill, you need yes. to learn how to speak Jillanese because, That's you right. know, you need to understand. And I tell couples that their jobs to really understand and get the other person and get themselves out the way. And if they can do that, they can make it. Now, isn't that kind of the same with your children? Because your children personalities are different and you have oh. to speak differently to your children. Every child, I have several kids, their personality is not the same. And it's not that you're being soft to one and hard to another. It's just that one may not be able to take what you're giving them. 
Absolutely. My children are, are grown, but they still have that little rivalry going on. They're so different. One is extroverted, one is introverted, one likes people, one shies away from people. Of course, with rivalry, it's like you like them better. And yeah. It's all, you know, and it's, just, it's different. You know, I had my oldest son could override any punishment I put him on mentally. He was just that strong. You know, if I say go to your room, he'll make up games, imaginary games on his wall. And, and the other one was always compliant, super, super compliant, but there was no need to go to your room or so for timeouts, but they're different. They're very, very sensitive to those differences and how you treat mm -hmm. them, but they all have to know that you love them. And there That's needs true. to be some standards that goes for anybody, no matter who you are, but you do have to raise your children differently, especially when there's a five-year difference between them, because Every five years, it's like having an only child. Yes. And then you have to consider birth order too. That plays a big role in it. So it's and, a lot to think about in parenting. And so my children are six years apart. When you say you have to play the birth role order as well, can you tell us about that? First children are tend to be very driven, very achievement oriented. It's your first, you're pouring into them, you're, you're working with them, you're teaching them, you're doing a lot of things. By the time the last one comes along, you're a little more lax and they tend to be a little more artsy and, and, and non-conventional. And then the middle child tends to be ignored. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to look at birth order too when we're considering our children okay we can talk about this for so long however our topic is really focused on women on women abuse yes. one day you and I we were walking and you told me well before that when we met and I went into your home you told me about the dissertation and I said oh my goodness that's deep and then when we were walking you gave me more information so can you really talk about women on women abuse yes I love this topic partly because I've lived this topic mm -hmm. and um it's hard to tell you what woman on woman abuse is unless I give you a little history on it, if I may. Yes. When I was a young girl in elementary school, even, I would get into fights. The girls knew what to say to egg me on. And that was, your mama's a hoe. Girl. I, <laughs> right? Defending my mother's honor. I fell for it oftentimes. I remember one particular time that I heard some voices in the back of me and I just turned to see who it was. Just out of curiosity, I think it's a normal instinct. And the girl said, I'm going to beat your butt after school. Oftentimes my morning prelude was, mama, can you pick me up from school today? Because my mother didn't work. She was a, a home mother. And she would say, again. And I would say, yeah, again. And it just seemed like the fights just followed me. And I didn't mm. really get why. It wasn't until later on in life that I began to understand it. But I think that brought out a natural curiosity with me. What is this with girls? I knew I was a little different, but I didn't understand how different I was until I got older and started studying philosophy. Then I'm pretty, you know, my worldview is like a Judeo-Christal existentialist, which means mm -hmm. I believe in, in God. And I believe that there's a purpose that he puts us here before we were born. He had a purpose for us and it's yes. up to us to find and live out that purpose. But I was just different. And typically you see up until now, in the past, there were a lot of men with that philosophy and, and not even Judeo-Christian, but existentialism. It would be men. And there's a dark side to that, but that's not, I'm more Western in my existentialism. Uh -huh. And so I just didn't understand some things. And then when I got to high school, I was pretty good at being mean. There was someone that I was mean to. I used to sit up at night because I was privileged enough to go to boarding school for four years. And I would sit up at night after the lights went out and I would talk to people on my on a little love seat in the hall. And I used to call those secret talks. Uh, I got great joy out of talking to someone in midnight, the midnight hours, uh, and in our little secret talks. And little did I know, being the existentialist that I am, my purpose was evolving through the fights, 
through the secret talks, mm. through different relationships that I had with people, through the parents that I got. My mother had green eyes and long sandy brown hair. She had issues with girls. She had a sister with dark hair and a sister who was ruddy red with hazel eyes. And then her older sister was very, very light with blue eyes. And so they stuck together and with the exclusion of other girls because they didn't treat them well. I say this to give you some history. And then I married and I divorced. I married again Mm -hmm. and divorced again. And it's kind of uncharacteristic because my parents were together 32 years before my father died. But I remember leaving the church because I felt shame. I was embarrassed. I didn't feel accepted. And so I went back to church, not the same church that I closer to my home. And I would slip in the balcony after the services started. Little did I know that I caught the attention of a man. This man was a recent widower and his wife had died of cancer. And the ladies there at the church were waiting to see who was going to get him. Wow. Um, you know, he, he did pretty well. <laughs> that happens. They, they be did waiting, pretty well. waiting, yeah. waiting, waiting with big dishes. Probably wasn't and, even warm yet. And that's true. That's facts. Well, I didn't realize what I was walking into. Well, because I had been married twice, they crucified me. And when I say crucified, they didn't physically string me up, but psychologically, oh, yeah. oh Come on. They crucified me and he thought it was funny, mm-hmm. uh, which was another form of abuse, to be honest about it. Because so you married, t- you married him? I did. He would tell me the things that they said. Ah, <laughs> isn't that funny? Wow. But it was killing me. It was killing me. I decided that I wanted to go back to school, but I didn't know where or how. And then I was working at a neighborhood high school as a speech and language pathologist. And I was standing in the office. A girl zipped past me and ran into the pool of secretaries. And a pack of girls also ran past me and ran into the pool too. And the principal wasn't there. He was out on business. They knocked her to the ground and began to beat her and stomp her. And I just thought, oh my God, that's someone's child. And you said so pool I of jumped... secretaries? Yes. What you mean? Yes. And they were stunned. Every... They were in shock, except for one. So wait a minute, me. they ran past you to secretaries? I, w- I was standing at the desk in the office talking with a secretary. Okay. The girl who had been beaten was thought that if she had run behind the desk, it was a safe place for her, but it wasn't. Oh my The girls goodness. ran and followed her. Wow. Into this pool of secretaries and beat her. It was beginning to beat her. There were a few secretaries that were just in shock, but I and the person that I was talking to jumped in. And we just began to pull these girls, peel these girls off of this child like a banana. You know, like mm-hmm. you peel a banana. Feeling them off of her. And I was just stunned. I went back to my office that day. I closed the door and I wept. I wept because I knew that what I saw was not human. And it was at that point that I was very determined to go back to school and to study this thing Mm. that I saw. So I did. I ended up doing a, um, a, some focus studies because there was no work done in this area. And just to get the information to do a dissertation. So a focus study is something that you can do for a dissertation. Yes, it is. Um, I wanted more information. So using the information from a focus study, we created a survey, did all the statistical testing, Mm -hmm. and it was a good survey. I distributed about 1,700 surveys across seven, 12 states. We got 640 back, and I didn't even want to touch them in entering the data. So we scanned them with SPSS, which is a statistical package, uh, mm-hmm. computer software package. And it turned out that the reliability and validity were 0.89, and that's higher than some IQ test. Mm. So it definitely showed that woman-on-woman abuse does exist. At that time, statistics on men abusing women was 25%, 25 out of every 100. In my study with women answering, it showed that 35 out of 100 women abused other women. In analyzing, and I had these behaviors and that, but in analyzing, that was a secondary find for me, Mm -hmm. which was suggested that as women, we teach abuse. 
And that was hard for women to accept. We teach abuse in how we talk to each other. Okay. We teach abuse in how we treat each other, how we fight each other. And when you've got a mother on the phone calling another woman a witch and, and with a B in front of it, you've got these children on the floor playing, Sally and Johnny, let's say, playing on the floor. And they hear mama, yeah, well, she's such and such, a, and she's not this and she's not that. You are feeding that into your child's spirit. The boys will then start acting out on relational aggression, bad talking, and the girls do the same. Lord. But for the boys being rough and tough and tumbling take it further into physical abuse. Okay. And girls are not far behind now because they do the rough and tumble as well. But then you wonder why we can't catch the red flags of abuse. And it's because we treat each other that way. We mm -hmm. say things to each other. Boy, and so do. it doesn't, yes, it you, doesn't seem me foreign. Right here, repent in the name of Jesus because <laughs> I know, listen, I know I have, even to the hour of having this conversation with you, I need to go and do some apologies because I had a rough day today. But it's so true. You are, you are right. It, is, it, it does. It starts somewhere. Remember the term that you're born as a clean slate? And I forget the name of the term. The Tabla term. Rosa. Tabla Rosa. And I'm trying to remember because I taught seven different psychologies 10 years ago in Tabla mm -hmm. Rosa. And we are, we're born with a clean slate until other people, social, different things come in and change, basically teach us how to live, how to think. What you're saying is absolutely accurate, but can you tell the listeners when you talk about existential um, quite a few times, can you break down existential for the, the listeners? Sure. And I want to go back to that tabla rosas as well. Well, existentialism is a worldview. There are several worldviews that we tend to fit, that everybody fits into. And to the Christian world, even like Miles Monroe. Mm -hmm. So that may ring a bell with people. And they're just saying, hey, God made you for a purpose. And let's find out what this purpose is. And we have to face our demons and we have to be responsible. We don't have to live life in despair. We can live a purpose-filled life. A lot of people may be able to uh, identify with existentialism through that. And so that's what I mean. Existential, when I think of that, I think when I was getting my master's, Victor Franklin. Victor Franklin. And I studied him. He made me think, when I think about existentialism, he was literally on his deathbed, but he wrote and wrote and wrote, basically stating you can change your being or where you are, your situation. Yes. You have the ability to do it. Yes. Well, Victor Frankl, for those who may not be familiar with Victor Frankl, was writing from a German concentration camp. Yes, he was. And the soldiers were trying to break him. And he wrote this book called Man's Search for Meaning. They wanted to break him. He said, and, and his mind was, you can break my body. You can break That's my right. bones. You can... <laughs> starve me. It's sort of like what I told you about my, my younger son, right? Yes. You can starve me. You can do whatever you want, but you can't my have mind. my mind. That's right. Yeah. You can't have my mind because That's my right. mind will determine who I am, how far I am, what I do. If Even if I can't do it physically, I have the ability to think and to be. That's right. Absolutely. Maybe open up my book tonight gonna make me open up my that's right that is absolutely right and that's important and I just want the listeners to really understand that so they can have a breakdown of existentialism so you want to talk about the blank slate yeah I want to go back to that because I can't although I understand it in its concept but I can't agree with it I think that it meant blank slate in the sense that we can take a child we can make it a baker candlestick maker, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we can train up a child. But there's so many factors that had not been discovered then. For example, gen uh, generational trauma. You can absorb the trauma that happened to your grandmother. Mm -hmm. It's passed the same fears, the same worries. It's passed through generation. There's so many things that happen and shape. There's so many models that we are either privileged to be around or not privileged to be around or things that we see 
people that come into our lives. And I guess that can go in terms of shaping and doing something with that slate, but life and thinking and becoming and being is highly complex, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. highly complex. That's true. And one more thing, when we're talking about trauma, we're saying young people now like PTSD. Mm-hmm. You know, it used to be veterans, mm-hmm. but you can have a 20 year old who has been in the presence of three or four shootings That's or right. somebody dying in front of them. That's right. And what's going on right now? Mm-hmm. We're definitely seeing that. And so are you seeing I, that in, in your field? Oh, I've been seeing it for a long time, a long time in, in the field. And we're not talking about just males. We're talking about females too. Mm-hmm. 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 And generational trauma. It can be horrific. And when you talk about generational trauma, let's just say you may have a grandmother who was raped or grew up in a certain way. That fear is passed down almost as if for you, it could have just recently happened that you can absorb the trauma of your family members. That's right. That's right. That's so true. And for me, this woman, woman thing had become very traumatic and to the point that I wanted to study it. I wanted to understand it. And maybe even somewhere in the recesses of my mind, I needed to prove that it existed and that I wasn't crazy. (laughs) It definitely exists. You're not crazy, but did you (laughs) overcome it? And if you did overcome it, how did you overcome it? Absolutely. Absolutely. One day I was on the treadmill and I just decided enough. I've had enough of this. And um, when you're really ready to change or to take responsibility for your life and your choices, nobody has to tell you, you know, you know, you're ready to do the work. You can get somebody to help you with the work, but you know, you're ready to do the work. I decided a couple of things. Shame was something that I didn't need in my life. Shame was between me and God. His grace covers my shame. Absolutely. And that shame, yeah, Mm. let me say that one more time. God's grace covers my shame. He takes care of that. If we look at the woman at the well, he didn't condemn her. And she went on to evangelize a whole city. If you look at the woman caught in adultery, he didn't use shame on any of that. Mm. He just said, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So God is only God that deals in shame. People deal in shame. He wants you to admit what you've done, take the guilt and be responsible, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't deal in shame. Mm -hmm. People deal in shame so that they can control you and your emotion. To parents, please don't raise your child by shaming them. Talk to them. Tell them what's right, what's wrong. But don't do shame because you're going to create in Pandora's box with with low self-esteem and the feelings of rejection. Just have them to be responsible and communicate with them. Back to the guilt and the shame. It was horrible. It was so horrible. I went on antidepressants. It was that bad. And one day it was like, "Mm -mm, absolutely not. I've had enough of this. I'm not living under this guilt. And is this Um, before you became a doctor in philosophy? No, it was after. I decided to do something about it. And that's one of the things. I, I picked up the second master's and the PhD simultaneously. And I didn't pick them up. I worked I worked hard for them. Yes. It was even, yes, I did. Yes, I did them in two different departments together. I would never recommend that to anyone no. ever, ever, ever. And got a 4.0 in both. But what did that do, do that. to you mentally? Oh, I was exhausted. I would yeah. get, I was getting chronic bronchitis, but I was driven. Now I understand I'm existential and I'm purpose driven. Yeah, I was driven, mm-hmm. but I was able to do the dissertation. I was able to write a book. I was able to go around the country and speak on that. And I don't know how many people I've affected. I pray that God has used me to affect many people. And I think that when I'm speaking with God, I thank him for making me a liberator. And so if that's the one word that I can describe myself with according to his will, it would be a liberator. Is that one of the things you want people to know about you, that you're a liberator? Yes. Liberators or whatever you, you have to go through a process. It's like gold, you know, you heat it up and you take that sludge off the top and then the master heats it up again and he takes the sludge off the top until, and he repeats it until he can see his image. Mm. God puts us through things. And when he puts us through 
things, then we have lived some stuff. Yes. And so then we're able to do like Timothy says with the older women teaching the younger women or the older people teaching the younger people and not even the younger, maybe some that just don't know, That's you know, right. so we're able to help. I couldn't be effective, not nearly as effective as I like to think that I am without his grace mm. over me, without mm. shame. Mm -hmm. And I will go on to say that I am happily married. I, my husband is a wonderful husband. Yes. I thank God for that. And I am not ashamed to say so. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. He has blessed me with someone who understands me. He told me one day when people tell me, ah, you're an overachiever or ah, you, you want too much or oh, you'll never be satisfied. I went to him one day and said that to him. He says, Deb, you're a stargazer. You, you were right. You'll never be satisfied. You're a stargazer. And you know, I looked at him, I thought, and so are you. I'm just so thankful for him. My ex-husband said that same thing to me. And you're just making me think. He said, you want too much. You do too much. And I haven't even started what I'm doing now. That was just me talking about the things that I wanted to do. I was not even doing them. It was a conversation. What I'm doing now, a lot of times we pick the wrong spouse. We do. Mm -hmm. We definitely pick the wrong spouse. And I often get into a discussion with people that say that God picked the spouse for you. And I'm like, uh, 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 because once you get married and you have your vows, it's already basically God. And I'm like, nah, but you pick that person because I'm telling you where I am now would not been able to happen with my ex-husband because with my husband that I am with, he is the one that elevate me because I do way too much. It is always something. He elevates everything that I do because I do way too much. Like you said, overachiever, never stop. But he speaks to me through me from the God that speaks through him. And so I truly believe the spouse we chose is not always the spouse that we are supposed to choose by God. I agree with you 1000%. But I'll tell you this, and I hope some young woman hears this and hear it, hear it, hear it. We have learned not to pick a man off the rack, mm -hmm. but to get a custom made man from God. Say that again. Don't get a, a man off the rack. Get one custom made from God because yeah, he knows yeah. what you I need, but like only him. if we would trust him. And the other thing too, I'm going to say to you is when you stand before God, it's just you and God. And he says, so now... Did you use the gifts and talents I gave you? Just like, just like, you know, with the parable of the talents, or did you bury them? And you're going to be able to say, yes, I use the gifts and talents that you gave me. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I want to use the gifts and talents that he gave me. Mm. and because nobody can answer for me I can't yes. say well it was that man it mm -hmm. was my children it mm -hmm. was whatever and then we have little eyes that have watched us mm -hmm. and we have modeled for them what it is to be determined mm -hmm. and tenacious and strong we got ripple effects whatever we do there's a ripple effect it to is. It. It so is. I just want to say to your listeners Ask God. He's given us all gifts. Ask him and go for it. Don't do anything just a little bit. Now, if you're going to go to hell, go to hell on a rocket. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's right. Don't be half in and Don't half be, out. And that's not right. enjoy and not enjoy any part of it. Go to hell on a rocket. That's right. You know, the word says whatever your hand find to do, do with all your might. That's right. I like that. Can I just say one more thing? Yes, ma'am. That I have struggle with my life I could look a man in the eye somebody who thought that they judged me and I will say this mm -hmm. I'm the woman at the well and it's my job to tell people about the good news to liberate people just like I've been liberated mm -hmm. I have no shame because God's grace covers me and I know how much he loves me he does amen we all have words of affirmation that empowers us. Your words of affirmation, you said Proverbs 16, 3. Yes, I, I love that. I'm going to add lib because I've read it in several different versions. It says, roll your work upon the Lord. 
Mm. Now, when you roll, you got to have some energy behind that. Mm. Roll your work upon the Lord. Commit wholly to him. And then it says, he will make your plans to align with his plans and he will establish your plans and make you successful. So commit completely to him. Give it to him. We don't have to carry these heavy things. Just mm. give it to him. Wow. That's He'll right. do it. He'll do it. Just like he did it for you. Just like he did it for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Is there any takeaway that you want to give to the listeners? Be of good courage. The word uses courage 365 times. That's for one for every day of the year. Courage means a lot to me. Even more than that, let's use calculated courage. Don't just jump out there. Have a plan. Calculated courage. I love it. Calculated courage. Have a plan. Don't just jump out and do something. Plan it. Plan your success. I love it. Yes. yes. So yes. <laughs> plan your work and work your plan, baby. Plan your work and work your plan. Well, y'all heard it. Plan your work and work your plan. Deborah, it was nice talking to you. Thank you for giving us information regarding what you do in your line of profession when it comes to need to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing what a lot of people don't know or even did not hear about, such as myself, which is woman-on-woman abuse. I want to say thank you. And as I always say, y'all better go out there. No more excuses. Wake up, baby. Wake up. Hey, smart people. I have a three-month one-on-one personal or business coaching program. As you all know, I paid off $50,000 in debt in one year. I will teach you how I stayed out of debt using my burner method and personal life spreadsheet I created to fit my lifestyle and keep me on track. You will learn how to understand your money communication style using my financial treatment plan. Also, if you own a small business and you feel stuck with cash flow or feel disorganized, I teach business owners and self-employed entrepreneurs such as yourself to financially maximize your money, build wealth, using your business income and retire working on the business while your business continues to run, such as myself. You can book a call with me. The link is in the show notes. Thank you for listening to No More Excuses, Wake Up. If you love the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or Spotify. To learn more about me and my different agencies and what I do, go to StanelleMyersEnterprises.com. While you're there, check out Money Therapy Institute and watch my video where you will see me doing a little acting, showing you how I fought and kicked down closed doors. You can also click on Stanetta Money Therapist and get my free budget spreadsheet. And of course, you can email me at contact at StanettaMoneyTherapist.com. I'm also on social media on Facebook at Stanetta Money Therapist and Instagram at Stanel the Money Therapist. No more excuses. Y'all know what y'all need to do. Wake up.